Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cleveland Direct Care Workforce Crisis Forum. We're so happy you took the time out of your day to join us. My name is Lisa Marsh. And I'll tell you more about myself in a minute. Um, Shannon, are you able to unmute yourself? I, I unmuted. This this webinar is being brought to you by Services for Independent Living. In the Ohio Olmstead Task Force. In the Ohio Olmstead Task Force. Is I Shannon is our webinar facilitator. <laughs> Shannon, I'll let you take it from here. Absolutely. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and thank you, everybody, for participating. A couple housekeeping um, items before we get started. Um, all participants will be muted during the webinar. Please type any questions you have in the chat box, I'm going to be um, checking it throughout the entire forum. Uh, we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. Um, the other thing is we're going to be doing a satisfaction survey that will also appear at the end of the webinar. Um, this is important for not only SIL, but the Olmstead Task Force to really get feedback on, on the forum and, and even how we did facilitating it. So any um, and all feedback is greatly appreciated. Before we get started today, I want to let everyone know that today's forum is being recorded. And live captioning is provided at this website, and Shannon, please put it in the chat box. If anyone attending would like a copy of the recording, you are welcome to email the Ohio Olmstead Task Force at ohioolmstead at gmail.com. And then it will be putting it in the chat box as well. And Shannon will put that in the chat box. Um, then I can welcome to the phone. 
Again, welcome to the forum. My name is Lisa Marn. Let me put my camera on. Um, can you see me? Yeah. You're not going to be able to see my face. I am the PCA LTSS coordinator. At services for independent living. In Euclid, Ohio. I I utilize direct care workers or personal care assistants, PCAs, for all activities of daily living. My fiance Eric does as well. You'll be hearing from Sherry, my PCA, later. This form is organized by the Ohio Olmstead Task Force along with the Ohio Centers for Independent Living. The OTF is related to Coalition of Ohioans with Disabilities Advocates and Organizations Working to Promote the Right to Live, Work, and Participate in Our Communities. In our I'll turn it over to Shannon for some background info. All right, thanks again, Lisa. Um, so, for many years now, people with disabilities in Ohio have struggled to find reliable direct care workers that will allow them to remain independent, avoid institutionalization, and age in place. In-home care is the glue that makes independence for many people with disabilities possible. Without it, you know, many people can't work, go shopping, socialize independently in their own home. Yet, despite activist attention to the issue, Ohio agencies have done little to alter the current system um, that fails to properly develop and reward the direct care workforce. The Ohio Olmsted Task Force is asking that we change this fact, that Ohio find a way um, to eliminate um, tedious bureaucracy, increase wages, provide benefits and educational incentives, and recruit those um, called to provide health care to the field. Uh, direct care workers, also known as direct support professionals, DSP sometimes, home care workers, job coaches, many other titles, um, they help people stay out of unnecessary nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Direct care workers provide hands-on care to people that need help with different daily tasks. 
Um, they bathe, feed, remind, they teach, befriend, they drive them places. Um, because of that, people with disabilities can go to school, they can go to work, um, stay active in their family, church, and, and whatever they find interesting in their community. Um, they are, in short, the backbone of the personal care plan. The COVID, um, I'm sorry, the COVID pandemic has also made this crisis worse, right? We've got this group that is grossly underpaid um, and it's physically demanding, but it's very, very necessary. Um, the Ohio Olmstead Task Force believes that the lack of access to in-home direct care is the largest barrier to independent living for people with disabilities, especially in Ohio. Um, we hope the forum will increase Ohio's attention on what we need to do to fix the direct care system for our friends, neighbors, and families that need it. Thank you, Shannon. Um, yeah. um. I would like up in the I would like to introduce our panel for today. Um, um, and I am, oops, I am, I am, I do it. In the mood. We have an awesome panel of three consumers. So huge. Do it. Yeah. We use direct care work. And one provide of direct care. Open and um direct our panel consists of Elizabeth Brassel, who is a consumer, Paul Evans, who is a consumer also, Kim Sellers, a consumer, and Sherry Carlson, who is a provider. We have invited legislators and officials. If any of those are in attendance, please unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Well, I don't hear anyone. It will go on. Someone will go on. We will now hear from the panel. And share how this crisis has affected their lives. At the end, we will have time for Q and A. So, our first is that it's out and out. Our first question is, tell us about yourself and how to, how the impact of direct care worker crisis has had on your life. I'll start with Elizabeth. Please unmute. 
Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm an energetic full-time college student. I work a part-time job. I volunteer, and I also have an active social life. Although I continue to live at home, I eventually plan to move out and live independently. My physical impairments limit the functional use of my body, but my brain works just fine. The, the direct care worker crisis has affected me personally because when the pandemic started, my personal care assistant that I had go with me to school, quit a couple days before the fall semester in 2020. So when the pandemic came and we had to quarantine, my person, my independent life came to a screeching halt. Um, as a result, my assistant, what, had to quarantine, so my parents had to step in. And then just two days before the fall semester of 2020, my personal care assistant quit. Therefore, my mom was forced to sacrifice her independence for mine. I am fortunate that she was able to step in. Otherwise, I would have had to drop out of school and resign from my part-time job. I've spent the better part of the last few years looking for replacement, but as of yet, I have found no one who is willing to take on this type of work. My life rests in the balance of my parents being healthy and able to take care of me, but I know this won't last for long. I am a young and ambitious person and have plans for my future. To fulfill these plans, I require the skills of a good assistant that are far and few between, and unfortunately, are becoming a very rare commodity. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask the same question to Sherry. Oh, oh, hold on. Okay. Um, oh, I have to work 12 hours a day. I'm sorry. I am Sherry Carlson, independent provider for Medicaid, and I work with Lisa Martin. And obviously you hear me, I work with her now. Um, so I have to work 12 hours a day, and bi-weekly I work 60 hours a week or 48 hours a week. I have one Friday off and and frankly, I am exhausted. And when the care workers don't come in, I have to go. So I just work a lot. Thank you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, but you're up next. Paul, you're up next. Okay. I'm, um, I'm Paul, I'm a 43 year old man muscular dystrophy. I'm retired now because of my health, but I used to be an embedded systems engineer. I had major back surgery about 10 years ago, and I've needed a lot more help since then. My muscular dystrophy is a progressive disease, so I'm constantly struggling to keep my activity level high and maintain my strength. To that end, I'm always looking for aids that want to help me stay as active as possible and not sit around and vegetate in front of the TV. In the last few years, and especially with COVID, this hasn't been going well, and I've spent a lot of time in bed or, or sitting around. Um, I need help physically with most things, ranging from personal care to running a household. There's not a lot of stuff I could do 100% by myself. I can use small, lightweight items 
is someone to hand it to me, but otherwise I'm pretty limited. So I need a lot of help to get up and dress and get going. During the pandemic, and when there's no aid, I'm forced to go stay with my parents who are in their 70s, and they, they really struggle to help me. And I'm unhappy uh, pushing them further and it's good for their own health. So while I'm blessed to have a family to fall back on, it's been difficult. Uh, before COVID, I was getting by on my own in the apartment and staying with my parents only on the weekends. Um, the apartment is accessible and the house here isn't. So anyway, that's a little bit about me. Thank you, boy. Thank you, Pop. Kim? I'm sorry, I, I am. Kim Sellers is my name, and I am a former radio disc jockey. So I was a broadcaster for nearly 30 years. So I worked a lot here in the Cleveland area. Then, obviously, going from completely independent to being very dependent has no doubt changed my life. It has um, forced me to need a direct care worker on a daily basis. And so the impact of the direct care worker crisis clearly affects me when I'm not able to have a worker with me. I am, you know, stuck and pretty much confined to a bed. I do have my mother who is nearly 80 years old. And so I'm not able to um, decline. I'm not really able to rely on her as much because her age has obviously gotten up there and she really pretty much is no longer able to do that before she could. So it forces me to use other help. I have to call you back. So it forces me to have to use um, others. I do have a few other care work caregivers. However, going through them is kind of like changing pants. You know, a lot of them, you know, they're they're not reliable. They um they don't want to work. They um you know they leave you stranded, leave you hanging. They a lot of times don't have regards for your doctor's appointments or physical therapy sessions. So it has been really very difficult for me to continue to remain independent. Although um, I have not done a lot of radio, I still do a podcast and run the Kim Sellers Foundation. But without a direct care worker, that limits the work that I can do to be productive in the community, which I so enjoy. Thank you, Kevin. There's a common theme in all these stories. That their family is their backup. Sometimes it's not feasible. It's an issue. So we're going to go on. Next question. How do you routinely use direct care work? What type of do you do they perform? What type of tasks do they perform? What happens when a worker doesn't show up for work? What do you do when you are unable to find you? And what do you do when you're unable to find 
workers require to support you. So we'll start with Elizabeth again. Having a personal care assistant allows me to live a relatively independent life. I'm not going to lie. It is a physically demanding job and takes the right kind of person to fulfill my needs. I have the ability to speak my mind and can independently drive my motorized chair, but I require full physical assist for just about all of my activities of daily living, from getting out of bed in the morning, to dressing, to hygiene, and eating. My assistant is required for transportation, setting up my technology, and physical assist for school, as well as help me with community integration, which is paramount for my daily routine. Because I still live at home, I am fortunate that my parents assume the responsibilities of household chores and meal prep. I do. Yeah. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, I can use my phone. I can um, manage simple tasks on the computer. And I can, as I said before, I can drive my chair, but pretty much all of the other tasks I cannot do myself. So if a direct care worker does not show up for work, I am stuck um, in bed. If I'm unable, if I'm unable to find someone, um, right now I rely on my parents, but this is not a long-term solution. So without direct care workers, I would have to live in a nursing home or assisted living, assuming that they had the help. Lisa, you can go on. Thanks, Elizabeth. Bye. Paul? Yeah, um, like I was saying a little bit, uh, before in, in my life there's a big difference between when things are working and when they're not uh, when i have an aid i can go be in my apartment and i feel like i'm my fully actualized the real self and then uh, when there is no aid and i have to come back and see with my parents who are who are getting up there and i spend a lot of time uh, not doing all the things i want to do but if i had an aid i'd be going out and doing my own errands and visiting my friends and, you know, just living life. But when I don't have an aid, I sit and wait for things to happen, I guess. So your direct care workers help you live an active life? Kim. So typically, um, my direct care workers pretty much assist with everything from personal hygiene, um, bathing, dressing, I'm sorry, bathing clothing, uh, makeup, hair, all the good stuff. Of course, I need assistance with eating and preparing meals as well. Um, I do go to physical therapy. I do have a trainer, so they do take me to do those things. And they also take me shopping, grocery shopping and things of that nature. 
when they don't show, well, and let me let me also say this, because exercise is a very important part of my illness. And when I deal with a lot of spasticity, I'm, I'm lived with uh, multiple sclerosis now for nearly 30 years. So movement is very, very important for me. I do have a few exercise pieces here that um, the girls will help me get on like my standard machine, which is a machine that allows me to stand up after they secure me in. Then it helps tremendously. So when a worker doesn't come to work, not only does it throw my physical abilities off, does it not only does it force me to kind of be stuck in the house, in the bed, it also even throws off those that love my loved ones because now they're forced to either come from their jobs or their kids or what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis to try to help me. Um, when I'm unable to find workers to support me, I typically have to um, really stay, sit, stay still. Not a whole lot that I can do. But although again, bless my mother's heart, she does everything that she can do. But again, she's nearly 80. So it's just not fair. I do have four daughters, um, but they're off to college. So I don't want to, you know, inconvenience them. So trying to stay as independent as I possibly can is so important. Thank you, Kim. Um, I kind of had to reword this question for Sherry. That is what happens when a worker doesn't show up for a scheduled shift. You are not scheduled to work. Okay, well, I answered this before, but I'll say it again. When a worker does not show up, Lisa calls me on the phone or her fiance will call me on the phone and I have to come in and do the work because she's like my sister. I love her and I will not leave her without care, but it's it's draining on me. And she and she wants to know what happens when her fiance's help does not show up. I had to help him also because I'm not going to leave him sit there. It's double work. So it's double work, yes. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. What do you feel are the two biggest challenges you have faced when trying to find, hire, and keep direct care workers? As usual, we start with Elizabeth. As usual, we start with Elizabeth. Well, first of all, I can't even find someone to interview, let alone hire for the position. Second, Although the pandemic has exacerbated the problem, keeping someone employed is difficult because the job, the job does not offer benefits and it does not pay a lot for the amount of work that is required. There is a certain amount of expertise and professionalism that is expected 
but the pay benefits do not match. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Paul? Um, well, assuming, like Elizabeth said, assuming I could get somebody in the door, um, longevity is also the biggest challenge I have. Um, I think I've had over 100 different care aids in the last 10 years or so. Um, I don't think it's obvious at first um, when you meet somebody which person is going to work out and which isn't. Um, I've had people stay for months or years, but the average for me seems to just be a few weeks. I think there's a few problems that seem to reoccur. Um, that care has to be a, a goal or a mission and be respected by the person themselves. You have to get somebody who wants to do the job. Um, the distance to commute becomes an issue, especially in the winter. Um, if they don't have child care options or family support, they have trouble maintaining a schedule. Uh, and that boundaries are important. People who uh, want to get into your personal life off shift or have been an issue. Um, some agencies tend to understate the workload and overstate the take home pay. And then when somebody actually gets in the job, that never works out. Um, the other challenge I've had is lack of on site support, either with agencies or with independent providers. It would be great if there were supervisors or somebody who could, you could call to come out. For example, to do something complicated for the first time, to show somebody how to do something and help training or settle a dispute. Well, the biggest challenge is for me, I'm assuming I was next. The obvious yeah, there's obviously pay. You know, I think that a lot of the um, direct care workers, because they know that there is a um, the, a crisis right now. They're taking advantage of that and they want, you know, crazy amounts of money, which makes it very difficult. They only want to work a couple of days a week. And again, I think, um, you know, for me, a, a challenge is finding someone where, or who I should say likes and enjoys this type of work. There's some people that are just there to pick up a paycheck, but there are others who, um, you know, who understand that this is um, a job that you've got to love. You've got to like what you do. And that is very, very difficult. And I think right now, because they feel they have the upper hand, that we as consumers are forced to just Pretty much, you know, take the treatment, then take what we can get or go without, then that makes it very difficult and it's so, so frustrating. Very well put. All three of you, thank you. If I can add my opinion here, I I have been looking for someone to work every other Friday for about four years now, and I can't find anyone. It's a real problem. So, um, the 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 my next question is based on first-hand experience with direct care workers. What two things do you think would help to end the direct care worker crisis? Elizabeth, you're up. First, I want to say 
with the personal care assistant. I am con I am a contributing member of society. I'm working and paying taxes. I'm volunteering, but without a personal care assistant, I become a drain on the system. I think two things that would help this crisis out. One, creating a program to certify workers to provide a higher quality of individual and justify higher pay benefits that are competitive with nursing aids. Two, I think educating the general public about this crisis will not only convey the hardship for individuals who are directly affected, but also the burden this hardship puts on society in general. I agree 100%. But Paul, you're up next. Okay. Um. I was thinking about this earlier. Um, it would be great to have a, a website like the um, ODH COVID map, the dashboard with all the counties uh, that treated the uh, direct care crisis the same way. And you could see which counties had jobs available for um, direct care and and consumers could apply for jobs to get links to agencies. So I think that would be a really great thing they could do. And then, of course, the big thing is money. Um, if it, if they don't increase the uh, the T ten thirteen hourly wage, they could provide a, uh, a tax credit or a seamless style payment to people who are low income or home health aides. And well, I also agree with Paul. Um, I believe some type of website that shows those who are looking for positions that might be applicable to um, any other consumers would be awesome. But I know I was with a group um, a while back and what you would do is the consumer would put up a posting saying, hey, the 50 year old woman uh, with the mask looking for assistance from day to day living, Monday to Friday, nine to five. And then all of the direct care workers would be able to see those postings. Then those who wanted to apply could go ahead and apply and vice versa. I think that would be a tremendous help. There's, there are workers out here who can't get to us, the consumer. And then the vice versa, there are consumers who can't get to those direct care workers. So that would be extremely, extremely helpful. But I know you said too, um, I mean, and obviously of course, uh, increased pay would no doubt be helpful, but of course we need assistance to allow it to help us pay because the numbers are just very difficult to, um, to keep up with financially. Ew. Thank you, Kim. So now, Sherry, in your opinion, what two things would help improve the field of direct care? Oh, sorry. I lost myself. Here we go. Okay. Oh, here I am. Okay. So everyone is saying more money, which yes, I agree with, but my in my opinion is benefits because if I had to do something and I can never be sick or go on vacation. Um and to uplift their profession so we don't feel like dirt. Um, we feel terrible. So. She said I'm not dirt, yeah. that's good. 
the UG. Yes. The um um what you can um then um Shannon, will you do the closing remarks? Before you do it. Before the Q&A. Absolutely. So, again, thank you to all of our panelists and participants. Uh, panelists, we appreciate you sharing your stories. Thank you. Um, if there were any legislators that popped on after um, we asked for introductions, you know, thank you for taking the time to learn about the issues facing people with disabilities in Ohio. Uh, the OMSA task force is committed to continuing this conversation with our community and decision makers. Um, advocates know that fixing these issues will take time and a coordinated effort between um, Ohio Department of Medicaid, Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities, Ohio's Department of Aging, as well as the governor's office. Um, we have some suggestions in the short term. Um, we feel it's important to increase those wages and provide reimbursement for training, mileage, the no-show issues, um, benefits, and provide educational incentives for the in-home providers. It's crucial. Um, we need to align the certification process for each waiver so that providers only need one certification to provide care to anyone who needs it um, and, and fix the issues that cause the delays in providers' ability to get paid for providing these services. Nobody wants to work for free. Um, create a college recruitment plan that draws workers into this field, the ones that are, you know, who are called to this field that want to be part of, you know, the disability community or the healthcare profession. And then last, maybe extend the emergency authorization that allows family caregivers to get paid as in-home providers. Um, that's huge too, we heard from Elizabeth. Um, in the long term, we need multi-agency coordination plans that address the methods for recruitment, incentives, streamlining training and education, healthcare and retirement benefits. Um, as well as, you know, wages and career opportunities that really make these in-home care um, providers, they will have a professional career. Um, again, it's, it's crucial and it's an ongoing issue. I mean, Lisa said it's taken her four years to find somebody and she still hasn't found somebody for somebody one, one Friday, one day a week, every other week. So, um, but thank you again for coming to discuss the issues again to all of our panelists. Um, participants, we look forward to working together to ensure people with disabilities have access to the support that they need so they can remain independent in the community. And I will check the chat box. And Lisa, there is nothing in the chat. So if anybody's been holding on a question, holding on to a question, um, drop it in the chat and I'll be more than happy to read it. Oh. Since we have a little bit of time left, there's something I would like to add to the conversation. Well, there's a question, I think. Is that a question, Shannon? I don't see anything. Uh, okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 uh, so it is and it it's totally dependent on his health in a bit to get in and out of bed. I did in the last year. I think in the last year. 
Nein, und, und. Ich hatte kein Nein, man, Über 20. About 20 times. No one Because no one has shown up. That's terrible. And it's frustrating for him. It's frustrating for me. Because of my role here. I can't solve his problem.
Ayan niya.